Excellent. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, um, I, I'll essentially try and explain a little bit. Um, I guess I'll leave this the former, right? I, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about what we do and then we'll have time for questions, right? So um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm, I'm Axel Zeitler and I uh, lead the, the Terra Health Applications Group in the department. We're all based um, downstairs. So the group sits in 107 and I'm in 105, so just behind the tea room. Um, if you ever want to stop by and say hello, feel free to do so. Um, and our labs are also downstairs um, in the in the corridor, just around where stores are. Um, so whenever you go to stores and go around the main corridor um, at the corner there, you, you can find our labs. Now, uh, what we do is we work with terahertz um, spectroscopy and imaging. And we're trying to find, um, we're trying to understand the technique and we're trying to find applications for it. Uh, for chemical engineering. And um, for those of you who have never heard of terahertz spectroscopy and imaging, which is normally the majority of people, to give you a little bit of um, a guidance, but when I say terahertz, I simply mean para as in 10 to the 12th and hertz as in the uh, unit of frequency. And um, that's located in the electromagnetic spectrum somewhere between infrared and, and microwave radiation. So um, depending on what units you, you are more familiar with, if you uh, know much about spectroscopy, then that's kind of a low energy of radiation. So it's beyond the infrared, which is sort of heat waves. Um, and it's not quite there where, where we have sort of microwaves operating. So the millimeters, hundreds of micron of wavelength, um, that's, where we're, that's where we're operating. And the reason why we're interested in, in this part of the spectrum in particular is um, in, in that um, from, from an applications point of view, it's quite exciting because a lot of materials that we use in, in chemical engineering tend to be transparent at terahertz frequency. So a lot of polymers, ceramics, semiconducting material um, uh, all have some transparency at terahertz frequencies. And at the same time, uh, we get some information about um, the properties of those materials, so spectroscopic information that, that will help us differentiate between different materials um, that we can probe with this technique. And um, that really sort of underpins this two strands of, of, of research in the group. So part of the group um, work on exploring structural properties of materials and uh, another part of the group um, more works on on the interaction of molecules that we can probe with the uh, vibrations that take place uh, at terahertz frequencies and this gives rise to these spectroscopic fingerprints. Now in very simple terms um, for the structural uh, characterization um, the Technique works a little bit like ultrasound um, that you may be familiar with already. In, in, in ultrasound, you send a pulse of um, acoustic waves into an object, and you can um, uh, look at how, how long it takes for reflections of this acoustic wave to come back to the um, emitter. And that tells you something that, of the depth of, of where these reflections occur. So it's what we call time of flight imaging. And uh, we do um, exploit the same principle, but we do it with an optical wave. And so this is a terahertz radiation. We make this into a very short single cycle pulse. And then we can probe objects with that pulse and look at the reflection. And um, depending on how long the pulse takes to come back, we know how deep the structure originates from uh, inside. And so this is like um, a reflection tomography technique, essentially. And so now we can explore materials that are um, opaque at visible frequencies, but are transparent to terahertz frequencies. And like I said before, this could be uh, polymers or ceramic structures. So we've applied this successfully for uh, polymer coatings, for instance, on pharmaceutical tablets um, and um, on, on cars, uh, automotive, uh, automotive structures. Um, um, but we've also gone deeper into materials. Here you can see this, this animation is a it's a layered tablet, so it's a, it's a tablet and sometimes you have multiple layers um, compressed on top of one another and we can look inside those. Uh, we can also look as to how liquid goes into these structures before they break down. So that's quite a, a lot of research in the group happening at the moment to try and understand how these processes work. Because they're very complex and, and the models are often rather empirical and we're trying to use the quantitative data that we can 
um, acquire with our technique to improve the understanding of how these processes work. And on the spectroscopy side, um, we, we um, look at the interaction of molecules, um, in particular organic molecular materials. Um, and the reason why we're particularly interested in those is because the energy of, um, of a hydrogen bond falls into the terahertz uh, frequency range, so the, into the photon energy here. And so we are very sensitive to molecular interaction, in particular of organic materials. And so when we started out, we looked a lot into crystals, and here you can see the motions that you would observe at terahertz frequencies are essentially the entire molecule uh, moving, translating, for instance, here the phonon vibrations, but they're often coupled in uh, rotations and translations, twisting motions in the, in the organic um, molecules because they're quite flexible. And so we can find out a lot about the crystal structures and the dynamics of the crystals and how the structure interacts with the dynamics. And to do that, we use um, ab initio molecular um, uh, uh, dynamics um, simulations, uh, but um, also solid state DFD calculations. Um, where we've gone there is, is also study disordered materials in, in, in particular. So how um, uh, amorphous materials behave, how they crystallize, what subtle differences in disorder do to those materials. So I guess that's probably my five minutes done. Um, um, I hope that was useful as a starting point. And, and of course, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to go through those. Cool, so stop sharing, Ali? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can do. Um, yeah. People might have questions about the slide. Ah, OK, yeah. So shall I put it back up again, maybe? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I don't I mean, it, depend, it depends on people's kind of questions, I guess, and, and knowledge of, um, of the area. So just from, um, from my side, this is something that I had never come across until I came to the department. I'd never heard of terahertz spectroscopy. How widely used is it as a technique? Like how many other groups are there out there doing this? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a, a sizable field now. Um, the technique sort of, it all started doing spectroscopy at these frequencies in the in the in the early 1970s, um, because well, spectroscopy maybe since the 90s, but um, it's been difficult to generate terahertz radiation and detect terahertz radiation until maybe the, the the 1990s, really, because we're at a part of the spectrum where uh, electronic techniques are no good in or not very efficient in in um, generating radiation, and there are very few optical techniques that can emit um, radiation here. And, all, and we all emit radiation, our thermal black body radiation also falls into this range. So we have very weak signals and, and very strong background signal, which meant this was referred to as the terahertz gap for a while. And then in the 1970s, people started to figure out with ultrafast lasers, you could generate single cycle pulses that have frequency components here. And then in the 90s, the first sort of spectrometers were demonstrated, and since the 2000s, the technology is, is commercially available. Now, in terms of groups working in this, um, there's an annual terahertz conference, and we've got six, seven, eight hundred people coming to those conferences. So it's quite a sizable field, but in terms of the applications, there are fewer groups um, interested in, in sort of end user applications as we are, maybe. Um, a lot of the community is, is really still um, involved in developing the core technology. So it's becoming um, available commercially, but what we're trying to do is really look for what we can do with this that might be interesting for uh, to complement a technique that already exists or to understand phenomena that take place at these frequencies that haven't been studied before. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a growing community, but there's lots of space. And of course, around Cambridge, there are uh, we have a, a great tradition in working on on terahertz spectroscopy. So. There um, is terra, um, uh, terahertz group over in the semiconductor physics department, uh, in the semiconductor physics group at the Cavendish, which is where our lab was based before we moved it into the department here. Um, and then there's a, a group in the um, electrical engineering department, um, Hannah Joyce's group over there, um, who work on terahertz. And then, of course, there's TerraView, which is a spin off company from the university and, and um, Toshiba who've co commercialized the technique, um, they're also Cambridge-based. So we, we're a, probably a bigger center than um, elsewhere um, 
but um, quite diverse research interests really. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Lara has a question. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the applications of the technique? Yeah, so the applications, um, we work um, to a large extent on applications in, in pharmaceutical, um, uh, for pharmaceutical applications in the pharmaceutical industry. So these would be um, on the spectroscopy side, um, um, application to, to support development of new um, small organic molecular drugs um, into new medicines. So to speed up the um, development of, of, of um, the drug molecules themselves. So what their crystallography is, how stable they are, whether they interconvert into different crystal structures easily, um, but also stability of, of um, amorphous drug components. So uh, that's to, to help with um, making poorly soluble drugs, drugs more bioavailable to, to, to patients. And then on the development of, of tableting processes, um, uh, that's still the predominant um, method for, for manufacturing medicines, of course. Um, so to speed up um, the, how we make high quality medicines and uh, ensure quality control there. Um, but we also had some applications where we translate the same techniques now, say to the automotive industry, uh, or where we work um, in, the, in the catalysis industry. So we had a project with uh, Johnson Matthew, um, to look at liquid transport in, in hydrogenous catalysts. Um, so really a relatively wide range there in terms of application, but a lot in pharmaceuticals. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, Liliana has a hand up. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm on the go, so that's why no camera. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Axel, would the, the terahertz also be useful for studying the drugs within the nanocarriers. One of the problems that we have is when we pack, for example, particular chemotherapeutics into the nanocarriers, we sometimes don't know in which form are they within the nanocarrier. And I don't know if, uh, if anybody has been using terahertz to really explore the integrity of the drug in those systems which are nanoscale, um, not macro, macro scale. So that's a really interesting question. I'm not aware of some anybody having done this, right? So what we can certainly measure is how they behave in bulk in these, in these carriers. Mm -hmm. What we can't do easily is to measure on the particle level mm -hmm. because the radiation, the wavelength of our radiation um, is, is hundreds of, of micron. Mm -hmm. And so you can't really focus it easily on, on a single particle like that mm -hmm. in the far field. There mm -hmm. are groups who, who have very impressive near-field imaging setups um, where, you, where you scatter the terahertz field of the AFM tip, for instance, that is done in close contact with a particle, and you can map over a particle that way and get a spectroscopic signature. Um, in principle, what you could find out is whether or not your um, drug is crystalline in the particle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, beyond that, you know, where you can tell which crystal form or maybe yeah. how it might oh, interact with other molecules. Yeah, so it, it would be out. quite an interesting um, thing yes. to, to explore. But we, what we could do quite easily is in bulk, yeah? mm -hmm. but then you don't know exactly where. Exactly. I mean, sometimes, some, and it's not even that important, you know, like what is the drug like in a single nanoparticle? Sometimes we just don't have an idea when we packed it and we have it in the wild, you know, is the drug still in the same form or is it, is it different, you know, yeah. did the crystallinity change? So in that sense, we would not even need a single nanoparticle, but just the overall landscape of how the drug look like. Well, that is really like good. It. And I think that's one of the actual advantages of the technique in some way that we can, we can measure bulk properties very precisely. And often the performance of, of a system isn't so much driven by um, what happens on the microscopic scale in, in, in one particle, because you can never know what the distribution is, right? Mm. So um, I think, yeah, the method, like all methods, works well in tandem with other techniques, but it yes. can give you a very quick bulk overview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very sensitive. So it's, it, I think about it in terms of that as a complementary method to X-ray diffraction. Mm -hmm. In X-ray diffraction, you measure the average position of the atoms, but of course they all move around um, at, at, at room temperature or whatever temperature you are. And at terahertz spectroscopy, you, you measure the motions that are involved in these um, 
large amplitude motions that, that govern uh, the cohesive forces of a, of a crystal, essentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions in the chat from Kartik. Um, so what is the maximum penetration depth and can you determine the composition of the material using this technique? So in terms of the ma maximum penetration depth, it depends a little bit on how much power you put in. <laughs> um, so for the sources that we use, um, we generate very, very um, weak pulses. So we generate um, our, our pulse um, energy, or well, say our average power is somewhere in the, in the nanowatts to microwatts. Um, but um, given that we have very sensitive detectors, we can still, uh, we can still read that signal. And um, uh, how deep it goes depends on the absorption, of course, of the material you send it through. So in these tablets um, that we analyze, for instance, in, we can measure sort of five uh, millimeter in depth, uh, maybe sort of five, six millimeters even in depth in reflection. So we go through those layers twice. Um, and that's kind of the limit of, of, of these sort of dry materials. If it, um, if it comes to water, and aqueous systems, we can only go as deep as 100 micrometers, yeah, because water is very strongly absorbing the radiation. So it really depends on the samples. So with the setups we've got, we can sort of span this range. Um, there are other sources of terahertz radiation that are more powerful. Um, quantum cascade lasers is, is one example. And then you can go all the way um, to, to nonlinear generation of terahertz um, in the lab, but then also uh, you know, central facilities that can make um, mega, mega watts of, of terahertz radiation. So it really depends on your tools. But I think realistically, we're talking somewhere between a few hundred microns to um, maybe uh, five, six millimeters in, in, in most materials. And then in terms of the question about the composition, that really depends on, on whether your system or you, whether your materials have a spectral signature at terahertz frequencies. So if you have a crystalline material, chances are that it will have a unique um, uh, feature because we are measuring these coherent motions, large amplitude, or large intermolecular motions, or you could, uh, yeah, that, that sort of type of motions. Um, uh, if it's a completely, if it's an amorphous, two different amorphous phases being mixed together, uh, it's much harder. We can see the presence of those phases, but we can't really get any um, specific information what they are. 